So let's start first by looking at the history, trends, issues, and challenges in the plant science industry. So our first module is based on chapter one of the book, Plant Science, Growth, Development, and Utilization of Cultivated Plants, the sixth edition, which was edited by Margaret McMahon. And specifically, uh, this chapter deals with the history, trends, issues, and challenges in plant science. It's important to know that this subject builds on previous subjects. And there is a requirement that all academic skills learned in the previous subject, AHT 101, are to be continued in this subject. These include essay structure, paragraph structure, referencing both in-text and reference lists, and the use of visuals in assignments according to the APA system. So too are the scientific principles and scientific writing methods that were learned in AGS 107 are to be applied in HRT 101. It's also important to know the content of Module 7, Horticulture in Australia, from the subject AHT 101, uh, which provides uh, some assumed knowledge and content that is relevant to the subject. And that content is necessary uh, background information for this particular subject. So it's important that if you haven't uh, done that subject, that you get hold of the module and that you study that module. Now, in terms of learning outcomes for this particular part of the module, first of all, we're going to discuss the role that plant science has played in history and continues to play uh, in the world. We'll discuss the trends and issues impacting plants and the methods used to grow them, including economic, social, and environmental considerations. We'll also understand how plant scientists take trends and issues into consideration when researching the solution to a problem. And we will also look very briefly at uh, understanding the fundamental principles of a scientific inquiry. So plant science, and therefore horticultural science, is a combination of botany with production and use of plants for food, fiber, decoration, and recreation. And these are just some examples of the many types of crops uh, grown using the techniques developed uh, through plant science, including wheat, vegetables, fruits such as strawberries, landscape plants, and uh, florist plants. In terms of the history of plant science or horticultural science, humans have used agriculture or horticulture to shape the modern world to serve and to please. Millions of years ago, most plants were pretty similar to what they are now. Many of these plants were angiosperms, which include grasses, trees, flowers, fruits, nuts, vegetables, and shrubs. However, many other plants uh, would be extinct uh, now. But through time, plant life has evolved, partly as a result of the changes in climate, into the plants that we know and grow today. So humans as a race appeared about three million years ago. Modern man, Homo sapiens, appeared about 28,000 years ago. And they were basically hunters and gatherers. And generally they had a little impact on plants and the ecosystem, although they did collect nuts, fruits and grains. But humans um, actually began cultivation about 10 to 12,000 uh, years ago. And in uh, cultivating, they then began to have uh, a dramatic impact on global ecosystems. It's most likely that cultivation began in tropical and subtropical Middle East and Africa, and plants from the wild were domesticated and cultivated to become the plants that we grow and use today. 
In cultivating, this reduced the need to travel or to follow the food supply, and as a result, trading began. And also, about 6,000 to 5,000 years ago, different crops were being grown in Mexico and uh, Europe. And at this time, the developing lifestyle had uh, was starting to have an effect on global ecosystems. However, as time progressed, trading increased, and this created urban centers. And as urban populations increased, so more food was brought in from rural areas. What happened then was that crop production areas were forced away from urban areas, often in areas less favorable for growing plants. And as a result of the urban growth, this ended up in what is known as the rural urban interface. And because of this, urban residents began to lose the knowledge of uh, crop growing. Cultivation methods developed mainly using simple tools at first, but later some of the first products of the early industrial revolution uh, were farm implements, such as mechanized plows, planters and harvesters. And as a result of this, the science disciplines of agronomy and horticulture were born. So agronomy is the study of field-grown crops, such as wheat, soybeans and forages. They generally require low inputs, however, they are subjected to significant processing. So horticulture is the study of crops requiring, requiring intensive care from planting through to uh, the customer. These obviously include fruits, vegetables and ornamentals and most are eaten or used with little or no processing. In fact one definition of a horticultural crop is one which requires individual attention to individual plants. However there are some grey areas where the two disciplines of agronomy and horticulture overlap where the distinction between agronomy and horticulture is not really a sharp line. And these might include crops such as turf grass and processing tomatoes, which can fall into either category of horticulture or um, agronomy. Now it's important to note at this stage that there is some additional history of horticulture in module seven, horticulture in Australia in the subject AHT 101 and you are expected to know and refer to this content in terms of assessment items. So let's look at general trends and issues in plant science and therefore horticultural science. So traditionally uh, crops or their use are commodities that are exchanged for currency. In the case of recreation areas, such as golf clubs or rugby fields, um, their use is exchanged for money. Now, according to classic economics, supply and demand has generally determined crop costs and therefore prices of crop commodities. So therefore, the costs of the products historically were determined by the costs of the inputs such as machinery, fertilizers, seed, labor, etc. Now classical economists assume that buyers and sellers are fully informed of the value of commodities and make their decisions based on those. The problem is that there are unaccounted costs, such as the cost of soil erosion to farming communities, for example, which happened in the United States in the 1930s, or the cost of tobacco on human health, or the cost of land clearing in tropical forest areas, specifically with respect to um, increases in atmospheric carbon. So traditional costs of crops usually did not reflect the cost 
of environmental impact and degradation, such as the effects of excessive fertilizer application on waterways, or pesticides landing on non-targets, or for example, the effects on soil loss through uh, soil erosion. Nor do traditional costs take into account the benefits, such as the fact that ornamental trees in urban areas can absorb carbon dioxide. So economists call these externalities, the costs or benefits not included in the price of commodities. Some scientists argue that environmental degradation occurs when no one owns a resource. So for example, if no one owned the land, it's in no one's interest to conserve the resource. And this is referred to as the tragedy of the commons. However, adding environmental impact or degradation to the cost of growing plants is actually being discussed now. And these examples of environmental degradation might be soil erosion or nutrients or chemical runoff, as mentioned um, in the previous slide. So these and other issues with production have led to the concept of sustainability. Now the definition of sustainability is meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And that was put together by Brundtland as far back as 1987. So sustainability considers not only what is good at the moment, but allows future generations to thrive too. Maintaining a sustainable uh, crop system requires not only a stable crop, but also good environmental relationships. And this is called the study of agroecology. So this looks at crop and environmental interactions. Now the ecologist Howard Odom has suggested that we use energy accounting to try to correct some of the distortions caused by using market to, to, uh, to determine pricing. So crop ecosystems depend on solar energy as well as resource inputs that require energy, such as chemicals, fertilizer, fuel. And in using energy to determine the more accurate value of crops has uh, been suggested, production costs would be determined by how much embedded solar energy or energy is in the crop. Nearly all forms of energy can actually be equated back to solar energy. And so therefore, energy would be all energy inputs, including resources or inputs. So this results in the derivation of embodied energy or energy from primary energy sources. The real issue is that when the amount of energy in a product is used to calculate its market value, the cost of most products would likely increase. So now let's look at some domestic trends and compare the United States, which is the source of the prescribed text, with some figures from Australia. In most cases, the trends in Australia match those of the United States, with a few exceptions. So the first trend or issue is that the real values of commodities has dropped, although they have stabilized over the past decades. The problem is that costs have increased. Secondly, the number of farms has been declining, with fewer small family-owned farms and more large corporate farms. Although it seems that this has stabilized in both United States and Australia. Thirdly, the number of farm workers is declining. 
in the United States, that has stabilized at around 2.77 million workers, and that equates to around only one per farm. In Australia, it's a little higher than that. Fourth, a small number of farms provide the majority of production. For example, in the United States, 10% of the farms produce 70% of the production. For most developing countries, farm subsidies are low compared to the rest of the world. In Scandinavia, however, the subsidies are very high. Subsidies are lower in Australia than in the United States. And in countries like Argentina, farmers are paid by government control boards at prices lower than market prices. And this obviously presents some problems. So things have had to change. For example, profitability has been helped by diversifying crop use. So for example, instead of growing corn, for feed or food, growing corn for ethanol. Instead of growing soybeans um, for feed or for food, uh, growing it to produce tofu. Some of the domestic trends, both in the United States and in Australia, are that the urban population has increased, the rural population has de decreased. Rural areas are usually more viable if they are close to urban areas. And suburbia has created problems, including loss of farmland. However, suburbia has also created new or additional opportunities for plant-based enterprises. For example, sports fields, golf courses, opportunities for landscaping, uh, nearby pick your own farms, or closeness to uh, farmers markets. So those were the domestic trends. Now let's look at some global trends and issues. And the main issue is one of an increasing global population. With the world population showing signs of stabilizing at about 9 billion by 2050. This increase, this increase in population is more so attributed to developing countries and not to developed countries. Both the United States and Australia were founded towards uh, the end of the 18th century. The population increased at first significantly, but is now stabilized um, in the United States. However, in Australia, the population growth rate has steadily increased, but the total population and the population density is very low compared to other countries. And much of this population increase is attributed to migration. Now, not only is the world population increasing, but energy consumption is projected to rise nearly twice as fast as the population growth rate. Assessing the world's food situation, it involves other factors besides the utilitarian one of meeting minimal food needs. There is also a rising affluence in developing countries where the protein requirements are moving towards more palatable animal products with the rise in requirements for steaks, chops, eggs, processed meats and dairy products. So this increased demand for higher quality food products, meat instead of beans for example, requires increased production. Added to the issues of increasing population, increasing energy use, and more affluence, there are additional issues, one of which is the continued loss of productive land. Most of the world's best agricultural land is already under cultivation, with the exception of some countries, including parts of Australia, Canada, Brazil, Sudan, and Argentina. 
in the developed in the developed countries there is increasing loss of farmland to industrial residential and recreational development for example in the united states and the european union but also in australia and a, a specific example is the loss of the uh, agricultural production in the sydney basin to urban developments to deal with these issues we require improved technology and incentives so for example new cultivars of wheat rice maize and horticultural crops have been developed by the united states and other developed countries however there are still many people experiencing food insecurity now food security is defined by the 1980, 1996 World Food Summit as existing when all people, all of the time, have physical and economical access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food in order to meet dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Now, where food insecurity exists, people experience malnourishment and in extreme starvation and it's important to note that food insecurity is an issue in many parts of the world even in developed countries so to address these issues agricultural researchers worldwide have done much to improve food security to developing countries they have developed and made available high yielding cultivars of food crops including horticultural food crops so much so much so that the food insecure population is likely to to decline from 21% in 2018 to about 10% by 2030 that means a reduction from about 800 million to 450 million people still many people with food insecurity Overall this decline in intensity of uh, food insecurity is about 34%. So food insecurity exists in all countries but is especially severe in areas of drought, wars and political instability. It's estimated that about 0.2 hectares of land is required to feed one person on a plant-based diet. There's enough land to feed about 8 million people which is the current population. But this requires yields in the developing world to be equivalent to those in developed countries in the future. Those yields would require about 10% of total energy consumption globally which is much more than currently used. China is a major challenge to the world's food supply. It has about 20% of the world's population and their population is about 1.4 billion but it only has 7% of the cropland which is about 1.4 million square kilometers. The United States has about twice as much cropland as China but it only has 20% or 1/5 of China's population. And for Australia the equivalent figures are 30 million hectares of arable land for only 26 million people hence the re reason why australia exports much of its agricultural production so this is an economic opportunity not only for the usa but also for australian farmers to be able to sell to china the problem is is that it would probably raise food prices for american and australian consumers and also it would increase energy use and this would likely hasten depletion of energy reserves where the current estimates are that the oil industry can keep going for another 40 years the natural gas industry for another 60 and that coal reserves could last another 200 years however they all pollute the atmosphere So using fossil fuel increases atmospheric carbon dioxide 
and this contributes to rising temperatures and weather changes and also has a negative effect on wild animals and plants. On the other hand, increased carbon dioxide levels would increase crop productivity, provided that the rainfall patterns remain. However, that is highly unlikely. And so this means that temperature, precipitation patterns and soil quality changes are likely to have negative effects on crops. And that suitable climates for growing crops would move to higher latitudes. That means further south in Australia or further north in northern hemisphere countries. One global issue is that production of biomass and biofuels as energy sources are dwindling supplies of wood for fuel from forests through deforestation. And in many cases, food crops are being replaced by biofuel crops. This loss of large tropical forests results not only in the loss of biodiversity of fauna and flora and environmental quality, but most importantly, the loss of major depositories or sinks for the carbon dioxide that we generate. Another major global issue is international trade. So this not only consumes energy and increases atmospheric carbon, but also provides opportunities for the introduction of harmful crop pests to new areas and may even lead to bioterrorism threats. In Australia, these are dealt with pretty well uh, with quarantine, restrictions and isolation, but there are still continuous breaches of these preventative measures. Some examples in the horticultural sector include Asian citrus psyllid in citrus crops, citrus canker, which is a bacterium which has reared its head in the emerald region of Queensland, the brown marmorated stink bug on fruits and ornamentals, and Panama disease in bananas. Another issue is the existence of subsidies in some countries where removal allows more international trade, especially from developing countries. The removal of the tariffs and duties will also increase trade and increase the adverse effects of international trade, such as the transfer of harmful pests and diseases. All of these issues and trends in plant science and therefore horticultural science are generating problems that need solutions for production increases, for more efficient practices, for better environmental care, and for much better economic viability. And ultimately, this intro introduces us to the topic of sustainable horticulture. And these issues need to be dealt with scientifically. So it's important for those involved in agriculture that the information utilized in agriculture should come from the scientific literature, not the peripheral media, which generally misinforms. A clear case recently has been the COVID-19 outbreak. Agricultural and therefore horticultural solutions can only be derived through proper scientific inquiry. And this involves identifying the problem, forming the hypothesis, testing the hypothesis, collecting data, interpreting the results, making conclusions and recommendations, and then reporting the results. And these results should be reported through the scientific literature or government or trade literature. Therefore, Seekers of this information should only really consult the scientific literature or government or trade literature, not the peripheral media. Now, this was all learned in the subject AGS 107, and students are reminded of the content and principles of that subject. All students should have completed that subject before doing this one, HRT 101. If not, then read the section in the prescribed text plant science um, and that section is called solution through scientific inquiry from pages 12 to 16 inclusive.
These changes to address the issues will only come from uh, proper scientific studies using what we call the scientific method. And this has resulted in many innovations recently, including genetically modified organisms or GMOs, organic farming improvements, new cultivars, high glycine maize, BT maize including sweet corn, golden rice, flavor saver tomato. However, while some of these have resolved world food security issues, some have fallen foul of the consumer and many no longer exist due to consumer pressure. So it's important that consumer acceptance should be based on the science and not the peripheral media. And that is our duty as horticulturalists to ensure that that actually happens. So in summary, humans and plants are mutually dependent on one another. Cultivated plants require attention from humans to survive. Human needs plants for basic nutritional needs as well as to add quality and enjoyment to human lives. We looked at some trends, most of which show that farming is becoming more difficult. The early scientists tended to focus more on production and quality. However, modern day scientists need to not only focus on production and quality, they also need to focus on economics, environmental compatibility, and social responsibility. That means too, that consumers should focus on the results of scientific research, which focuses on sustainability. The template for this PowerPoint comes from the Plant Science book. However, other materials and information have been added from other sources, all of which have been acknowledged throughout the presentation.